This is the first in a series of lectures on compression structures. We're going to start with arches and we're going to talk about how we achieve true arch action. There are many structural forms that are curvilinear in nature and we have a tendency to call them arches, but they don't necessarily act like arches. An arch is acting in pure axial compression with no bending. So we're going to talk about what that means. The arch in its ideal form should be acting in pure axial compression with no bending moment and no bending shear. This implies that the support force at the end of the arch must be tangent to the direction of the arch. This tangent force has both a vertical component, which handles the gravity force, and a horizontal force or component, which we call the buttressing force. So here we see this vertical force V is equal to WL over two, where L is the span and W is the uniformly distributed load along the horizontal. So the entire force, downward force on this arch is WL and we'll have a support force at each end, which is WL over two. And then there is a horizontal force which is what's necessary to go with this vertical force to produce a, a resultant reaction, which is parallel to the direction of the arch, or in other words, tangent to the arch at the point of support. If the arch becomes more shallow, the vertical force does not change, but the horizontal force must always adjust so that the net support force is axial on the arch. Taking half of the arch as a free body, so we slice it through here and keep this left half. We get this view right here. And we see that there are only two horizontal forces. Equilibrium requires that the horizontal force uh, on the cut face be equal to the horizontal force at the support point. So here we have a couple of force of horizontal forces. Now, the next step we would like to take is to resolve this distributed load W into a point load. So in this case, we have half of the arch still in place. That means we have half of the original load. The original load for the whole arch was W times L. The load for this half will be W times L over 2. Or And that force, by the way, will be at the center of this distributed force. So now we have this really interesting uh, diagram where we have a horizontal force couple consisting of these two H forces and a vertical force couple consisting of this reaction component, WL over 2, and this load component, which is also WL over 2. When we took this free body, we took we cut the length of the original object in half. And then if we center this force in the middle of that, then the lever arm between these two vertical forces is going to be called L sub V, meaning the lever arm for the vertical forces. And it will be L over four or one quarter of the span of the arch. Now, the moment of the vertical forces is going to equal the magnitude of one of those forces, which is WL over 2 times the lever arm, which is L over 4. So here we have the force, WL over 2. Here we have the lever arm. When we multiply them together, we get WL squared over 8. WL squared over 8 is a universal uh, maximum moment for any structural element that is spanning a distance L in simple span mode and has a continuous load W along the structural member. So we get the same expression that the moment of the vertical forces was WL squared over 8, whether this is an arch or a tension member or a truss or a beam, as long as it's spanning a distance L and has a load W distributed along it. We sometimes call this the imposed load. It's imposed on our structure 
by whatever loads we have to deal with, plus whatever decisions we've made about how far we're going to span. The moment of the horizontal forces is the magnitude of one of those forces times the lever arm between them. So if we extend the line of action of both these horizontal forces, the spacing between those two lines of action, we're calling the lever arm for the horizontal forces, or L sub H. Um, so the moment is going to be the magnitude of one of those forces, H, times the lever arm, L sub H. We often call this the internal resisting moment, meaning it's whatever it has to be to overcome uh, this moment of the vertical forces in order to keep the structure stable. So an interesting question is, what happens when the buttressing force is not provided? So here we see a glue lamb arch, which is spanning 100 feet. It has a load of 9,000 pounds per foot. And the cross section of this arch is one foot by three feet. Um, those, by the way, are not exactly common dimensions, but this is a hypothetical problem that we would like to analyze to see um, what are going to be the issues internal to this arch. Um, so for the moment, we're not going to worry about whether we can buy one inch, one foot wide boards or not. But we're just going to take this as a simple cross section that we can work with. We've given this arch a rise of 25 feet. So the lever arm between the horizontal forces is 25 feet. Now we've shown here a compressive force on this end face of the arch, which is perpendicular to that end face or tangent to the direction of the arch. Now the question is, what happens if we remove the horizontal component of that force? So that could happen, for example, if we, instead of providing some kind of pin joint here, we put a roller joint where one end of this arch or both ends of the arch could splay outward. If we could also create a situation like that more commonly in buildings, by putting this curved spanning member on top of some tall slender walls. Um, those walls would provide vertical support through column action, but they would not normally be anywhere stiff enough or strong enough in bending to provide the horizontal buttressing force to hold the arch together. In other words, they won't be able to resist the outward thrust of this arch. So these are a couple of examples of how we might have a curve, curved element that's supported with essentially just vertical forces and no horizontal forces. So here we draw a picture of what that would look like. Uh, this is the true arch with these forces tangent to the direction of the end. And here we have just vertical forces that represent the influence of the bearing surface on which this curved element is resting. So when we draw a free body of that, we get something like this with a vertical force WL over 2, but no horizontal force like we had before. So the question is, what's going to keep this stable? Again, when we find the equilibrium or the uh, resultant rather of this distributed force, it's a vertical force downward of magnitude WL over 2. And again, we have the same force couple that we would have had before. None of that is changing by virtue of the fact that we have removed the horizontal buttressing force up at the end of this member. But now we have to find some way of replacing the force couple. We had an H force here. We had an H force there. They were creating the internal resisting moment. Now, whatever that is, it has to exist on this cut face. So if we blow that end up and show a picture of it, we see that it's in bending. And basically we have a beam. It just happens to be a curved beam instead of a flat beam, but it's uh, resisting this tendency to rotate through the classical kind of triangulated stress distribution where we have compression on the top 
in tension on the bottom, and we have the worst tension stress at the extreme lower end and the worst compression stress at the extreme upper end. And now our lever arm is just two-thirds of the depth of this beam, whereas before it used to be the entire rise of the arch. So the rise of the arch is 25 feet, the depth of the beam is three feet, and then we are really only getting an effective lever arm that's two-thirds of that or about two feet. So we have very drastically reduced the lever arm for structural action. So now what we'd like to do is we'd like to compare what is the state of stress, the magnitude of the stress for this true arch versus this situation, which is basically a curved beam. Now, we know, and we're going to talk about this in much more detail, but we know at the top here we only have a horizontal force, but when we get down to the bottom we have both the horizontal and vertical force. So the, the largest compression force in this arch is down at the base here. So if we want to know what's the limiting stress on this structural system, we need to go We want to go find the compression stress here. However, on a beam, we know that the worst bending moment is at the center. So we want to go find the bending stress at the center of this beam. And when we go through the mathematics of that, and by the way, all the mathematics is in the book. I'm not going to repeat it here, but I'm going to just make the key points. Um, this is the axial stress that's shown at the base of the arch. Um, little f axial, and the arrows are so short that all I could depict were the arrowheads here. On the other hand, at the top of the bending member, in other words, at the center of the curved bending member, this is the bending stress that we get drawn at the same scale as the axial stress here. So you can see how dramatic it is. The actual number is the bending stress is more than 35 times as large as the compression stress for the properly buttressed version of the structure. In other words, the arch has only 1 35th as much stress at its worst stress location as does this curved beam. Um, if you'd like to have an analog to this that you can understand in a very acute way, Imagine standing on a carpet with your legs spread wide apart. You know that the friction of that carpet is what allows you to be comfortable in that position. Your legs are basically in compression, and they can be that way because there's a buttressing force at the bottom of your feet. Then imagine how it would feel if that carpet suddenly turned to an ice sheet which gave you no such horizontal component, uh, then you would suddenly experience uh, what this curved beam is going through. <clears throat> In my R's uh, San Genitobo Bridge, the buttressing force is provided by a stone mountain on each end of the bridge. We don't normally have uh, a landscape that can provide such a profoundly reliable buttressing force. So we normally try to find some other way to provide it. As an example, this is the Broadgate Exchange House in London, which was designed by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. In this case, uh, there are four of these arches, one on each facade plus two in the core of the building. And they're all sitting up on these pilings. And there's a tie member that runs across the bottom of this thing, which is what provides the buttressing force. So we can call this a tied arch. And this is a close up of that detail where this is the arch element and this is the tie member. We have a similar kind of structure in the Moscone Center in San Francisco. Uh, the roof of this space supports a huge public plaza occupying an entire city block, and it's all supported on these arches. 
These arches support the assembly loads, which are around 125 pounds per square foot, a uh, substantial amount of soil, vegetation, and paving above. The base points of each arch are tied together with steel cables that run under the floor slab, so they're not visible here. Those cables were post-tensioned to raise the arches up off the formwork that was used to support the wet concrete when it was poured. It's a beautiful way to get a very uniform stress in the arches, avoid unnecessary deflection, and also assure yourself that the arch structure is working fine before you pull your formwork out from underneath it. <clears throat> Some structural members may be given a curvature to make them resemble an arch and to give them a certain pleasing feeling, but they are definitely not arches. Here we have a spanning element which has a very low curvature and not much rise, and it would produce a huge horizontal force on the, the supports. You'll notice there's nothing in this environment that reminds you at all of the rock mountains that Maillard was able to use to provide the buttressing force on his bridge. Here you have moist soil, which will not be able to provide much of a buttressing force at all. So this is actually a curved beam. It is not an arch. It is not working in axial stress. It's working in bending stress. And not surprisingly, it's fairly deep uh, as an expression of the fact that it needs to be a bending member or a beam. Here we have a similar example. This is also a glue lamb beam, um, which uh, is way too shallow to make any sense as an arch. Sometimes arches standing beside each other are able to buttress each other. So, in fact, all the arches in the string of arches are mutually bracing. One tries to spread, but the one adjacent to it is also trying to spread, and collectively they are all mutually supporting. Um, that works as long as the entire ring is there, and as long as the ring, the curvature of the ring is not too tight. So, all of these are sort of lined up with each other, and they're all working quite well in a mutually braced uh, relationship. On the outer portion of this structure where stone has been taken away to be used in other structures, the element was not properly buttressed at that point. You'll notice some buttressing has been added to uh, at the ends, both there and there, in order to make these arches work. But if you wanna look at what was happening before they made those repairs, Basically, these arches were in the process of collapsing because they could not uh, withstand. They had no buttressing force to hold them together, and they were beginning to crumble apart. So this is another view of that massive buttressing element, and then this is a view from around the back side of it, which gives you a sense of uh, how massive it had to be. And here again, we have... Uh, somewhat less monolithic, but nonetheless a buttressing element, a buttressing element, and so forth, uh, all of which is are crucial to keeping the last arch from spreading apart. This construction lacks such an end buttressing element. So when we look at, at the end here, we got a column, which is a pretty fat column, but it's not designed to to uh, handle the outward thrust of an element of these proportions. And there's nothing on the other side. There's no buttressing element. There's no continuation of the arches. So we would wonder how this element is working. In the case, in this case, this structure is just fine because these are actually fake arches. And if you were there during the construction, uh, you can see the flimsy exterior cladding, which is shaped to mimic massive arches, but is in fact uh, light gauge metal work with sheathing around it. And what actually holds this structure up is this uh, slender pipe column and a 10 inch deep 
super lightweight uh, wide flange beam, which spans over to the next one of these elements. So this is the cladding that's going to surround the slender column and make it uh, disappear. That ends our first video on achieving true arch action by providing a proper buttressing force.